In this video, we're going to look at chemical equations, or more commonly, what's referred to as a chemical reaction. Um, so first, we're going to define what it is, and then we're going to talk about some important things, um, like things like phase labels and um, how to balance uh, chemical reactions. So a uh, chemical reaction is basically a statement um, of chemical or physical change. And you've basically got a set of reactants, which is your starting point. So what do you start with? And then you have your products, which is what you, what you end with. For those of you who have taken like a high school level physics, this is very much the concept of a state function um, in terms of, that's a mathematical term, but in the case of a chemical reaction, in a, when we write the chemical reaction, we write the reactants, which is what we're starting with. So these are the chemical, these are the chemicals or materials that we start with. And then we write the products, which is the end point. So we don't necessarily know how it's, how it gets from start to finish. We just know that these are what we start with and these are what we end with. And when we write these out, there are a couple of different things that we have to note. So when we have a starting point and an ending point, it's always helpful to, t to say what the physical states are. Because this could make a difference, right? Um, you know, you might want to produce something that's in a gaseous form. So when you write a chemical reaction, it's important to note what the physical states are. And you have a couple of different options. So we have a gas, which is usually denoted in parentheses by G. We have solid, which is usually denoted in parentheses by an S, and we have liquid, which is usually denoted in parentheses by L. And there's one other one, uh, aqueous, which is when something is dissolved in water, and that gets an AQ in parentheses. Okay, so the next important thing is that we have to make sure that chemical reactions are balanced. Let's take a look at an example. So uh, if we write KClO3 goes to KCl, plus O2, and we have to note the phases. So we have KClO3 solid goes to KClO solid plus O2 gas. So the question is, is, well, why do we have to balance a reaction? Or what does that mean to balance a reaction? So if we look at this reaction, one thing that we have to make sure is that um, we have to follow the rules. And one of the rules is conservation of mass. So the question is, is does this equation follow conservation of mass, question mark. So we can kind of start to get a sense for that. So on the left, we have um, one potassium, we have one chlorine, and we have three oxygens. And on the right, we have one potassium, one chlorine, but we only have two oxygens. So that's a problem because this does not follow conservation of mass, right? We can't lose oxygens. They can't disappear. This is what we call a reaction that's not in balance. Um, this reaction has, it, it, may, it may represent the, um, the products and reactants that are there, but it doesn't necessarily accurately represent the quantities. So what we have to do is we have to do something called balancing reactions. There's actually a process for balancing reactions. So the first step is to take an atom inventory. This is really important because this, as we sh sort of showed before, this will tell you if you are in balance or not. The atom inventory um, has to be equivalent on the reactant side and on the product side. So each atom has to match up from products to reactants. So that's why we start there. Now. As you get better and better at this, you'll be able to start to recognize that in aqueous solution, um, you can balance polyatomic ions together as a unit if they appear on both sides of the reaction. So at the beginning, you may not necessarily be able to appreciate that, but as time goes on and you develop more and more experience, especially when we get into chapter four, you can start to see that polyatomic ions work as in groups uh, oftentimes. So, to the things to watch out for are primarily this is gonna be an aqueous solution. So I'll just put that as a caveat. Oops, aqueous solution. 
um, for the polyatomic ions being together. And that's essentially just when everything dissolves, those polyatomic ions will move around as units in solution. So then the next thing we can do is we can start by balancing atoms that appear in only one reactant and one product. Now the reason why we do this is because this makes life a lot easier. When you start with an atom that appears in only one reactant and only one product, you're not facing this battle of having to sort of sift through and change multiple things at once. And then you typically balance the O and the H last. So um, these, will, these are often gonna be found in multiple um, reactants and products. And in this case, you want to look for common multiples, meaning like if you have a three on one side and a two on the other, the common multiple would be six. And then the last last thing that you're going to do is uh, just like with ionic compounds, the coefficients in a chemical in a chemical equation are written as the lowest um, ratios, right? So if it's a ratio of one to one and one to one, then you would not write 2222, two, two, two. you would reduce that to 1111 um, on both sides. So we keep everything, um, we make sure that we can't divide anything by an integer other than one. That keeps everything at its lowest. Let's actually try to balance using those instructions the reaction that we had before. So let's take our KClO3 solid goes to KCl solid plus O2 gas. So we're going to start with our atom inventory. So we have K is, is 1 on this side, Cl is 1 on this side, and O is 3. We have K is 1, uh, we have Cl is 1, and we have O is 2. Okay, so let's start, so we took the atom inventory, that's step 1. Step 2 is to balance atoms that appear in only one reactant and one product. So in this case, this would be the K and the Cl. So if you look, the K, the potassium on the left, appears only in the potassium chlorate, and it only appears in the potassium chloride on the right. But it turns out that that's already balanced, so that one we won't, we won't have to do anything with. And the same goes with the Cl. The Cl is in the potassium chlorate on the left, and it's in the potassium chloride on the right. It's already balanced. So we can move on from step two, because those are already done. Um, in step four, we now are going to balance the O and the H last. And this is where the common multiple issue comes in. So in this case, we have a three and a two. So the common multiple would be to get these to be both six. So the way that we're gonna do that is on the, on the left side, to make this a six, we're gonna to have to multiply this by two. And on the right side, we're gonna to have to multiply O2 by three. Uh, and then that's going to get us both the O and the O on the left and on the right to be 6. But we have to redo our atom inventory because now, if you look, when we put the 2 here, our K now increases to 2 and our Cl also increases to 2. So now on the, the left side, we have 2K and 2Cl. So on the right side, we have to make the K and the Cl 2. And the, the best way to do that is to put a 2 in front of the KCl. So that is now going to make us 2 and 2 and we check that our atom inventory matches, we now have um, conservation of mass, so we're balanced. Let's take a look at some examples. Okay, so let's start with the um, an easy one. This one is calcium plus H2O goes to calcium hydroxide plus H2. For this one, we're gonna start by taking our atom inventory. So we have calcium is one, Hydrogen is 2, oxygen 1. Calcium is 1. Now, here's a good example of, of being careful. This little subscript 2 here, because this is a polyatomic anion hydroxide, that means that we have two O's and two H's. But we also have to be careful because we also have these two H's here. So we're going to add that to our H inventory, and we're going to have H4. So now let's look at how we would balance this. Starting with our steps, uh, we did the in atom inventory. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look to see if there are any atoms that appear in only one compound on the left or on the right that can be balanced. And in this case, that would be calcium. But unfortunately, the calcium is already balanced. Well, I guess you could say fortunately, the calcium is already balanced. So there's really nothing to do with calcium. We move on to our hydrogens and oxygens, which we balance last. If you notice, the oxygen and the hydrogen in this case, let's look for a common multiple. On the left and on the right, it looks like we have to double each one of these. So to do that, we can put a 2 in front of the H2O, and that's going to give us a 4 and a 2. 
and that's going to get us into balance. So that was an easy one. Let's look at a little bit harder one. So let's start with our atom inventory, and this is obviously a much more complicated one, but if you follow the rules, we're going to be okay. So we have Fe2, and in this case, this is one of those cases where the polyatomic ion, we can we can keep that polyatomic ion group together. So if you look, we have SO4 on the left and we have SO4 on the right. And it's still, it's S, there's no other sulfur compounds that are in this. So we can keep that SO4 group together. So we can put SO4 on the left with three, and we can put SO4, and we'll put SO4 on the right when we get to it. Now let's do our nitrogen. So our nitrogen on this case is gonna be a one, our hydrogens is going to be a 5, because we have 3 here and 2 here. And then we have the oxygen, which is a 1. So on the right, we have Fe, which is a 1. Uh, we have, now we got to start being careful here. So we have our oxygens, which is a 3. Our hydrogens, which we're going to start to add up now. So we have 3, and we have four and times two is eight. You'll notice that I write an eight for the number of hydrogens. That's actually incorrect, it's 11. There are three coming from the hydroxide and there are eight coming from the ammonium. So it's a total of 11. We have our sulfate, which is just gonna be a one. And then our nitrogen, which is gonna be two. Okay, so, cause remember we have two of the nitrogens in the polyatomic ion. So now let's start with our rules. So let's look for some atoms that are only in one compound. And there are two examples. So we have the iron, which is present in the iron sulfate on the left, and it's present in the iron hydroxide on the right. So that's as good a place to start as any. To get those to balance, we're going to need to put a 2 in front of the iron hydroxide. Now we have to remodify our counts. So that's going to get us two irons over here. And um, now we have to double our oxygens and hydrogens. So let's be careful about this. So we have three oxygens. We're going to multiply that by two. That's now going to be six oxygens. And we have three hydrogens, which we're going to multiply by two gives us six. Plus we have eight over here. So six and eight is 14. Another thing that we can do is we can balance out, so we have a couple of options here. We can balance out the nitrogens, which appear on one side, one on each side only. So um, we could do that, or we could balance out the sulfate. Let's do the sulfate example. So uh, to get the sulfates to balance, we're going to put a three over here on the right. That's going to get us three sulfates. And now we have to re-add up our nitrogens and hydrogens. So in this case now, we're going to have uh, two nitrogens times three is six. And we're going to have uh, four times two is eight times three is 24. Plus our six is going to give us 30 hydrogens on the right. Okay, so now the nitrogen is another good, another good one to do because again, that's, on, that's another atom that only appears in one. So over on the left here, if we want to get six nitrogens, we need to multiply the NH3 by six. And that's helping us out because that's going to get us some more hydrogens. So if we add up the hydrogens again, we get six times three is 18 plus two is 20. And so the last thing we have to do now is balance out the oxygens. On the left side, um, we only have one oxygen, and on the right side, we have six oxygens. So to get that to balance, we're going to put a six in front of the water, and that's going to get us our six oxygens. But we have to make sure we carefully add up all of our hydrogens. So we have six times three is 18, and now we have six times two is 12. So 18 plus 12 is going to be 30, and I think we're there. So we have uh, our irons check, our sulfates check, our nitrogens check, our hydrogens check, and our oxygens check. So we're good. So just to kind of review the sequence, first we did iron, then we did sulfate, then we did nitrogen. And the reason why we started here is these are all in only one compound on the left and on the right. And you could have done that in any sequence. Any You could have started with any one of those three 
and you would wind up at the same place. And then notice what we did last. Then we did oxygen and then we did hydrogen. And these we do last and that allows us to get to a very, this will, the first three allows us to get into the right ratio areas and then we just kind of finish it off with doing the oxygen and the hydrogen. So those are the examples that we're going to go over for balancing. Um, this is something that's going to require a lot of practice. So make sure that you practice balancing a lot. Um, start with some simple ones, get the steps down. Once you have the steps down, then you move on to the more complex ones like this, this latter one where you have a lot of different things going on.